so great to see people come in. Yes, it's fantastic. <laughs> hey, Chitra, I'm going to yell out names that I, that I recognize if that's okay. Go for it. In, in, in the absence of your faces, I can see your names and I can see that Duya is back. Hey, Duya. Duya runs an amazing uh, uh, startup in Mongolia. Yeah, yes, yes, I know Duya. Hi, Duya. Chitra runs KBR. We have huge, huge respect for her. So we're going to wait for another 30 seconds before we begin. For sure. Excellent. I think we have quorum, so I'm going to start. Uh, hello and welcome everybody to the last of six sessions we've had on Empowering the Truth. That's the name of the series. And today we have a masterclass on design basics with Rishad Patel, who is the co-founder of Splice Media. And for over 20 years, Rishad has designed and developed media products and branding for audiences and users, for companies and markets in Asia, New Zealand, Europe, and the United States. Uh, he's been a design consultant for MIT and ETH, an editorial consultant at various news companies and co-founded also a gifting app startup in San Francisco. So um, I'm super excited uh, for what Rishad is going to teach us. And before I hand it over to him, uh, let's quickly look at where we have been um, and so far in the series. Of course, we started with Dr. Masato Kajimoto. Um, that was a keynote. Then we had uh, Shohini Guharoy doing uh, a session on distribution on social platforms. Then we had a mobile video for truth telling by Manon Varsho and Sanjay Biswas. We had Amit Varma on podcasts. And last week we had uh, Rishad's co founder, Alan Soon, on strategic communication on getting the overall strategy right. And here's where we are today. And uh, here's what's coming up next. So we are also as part of this series, uh, we're giving out multimedia project grants. This, of course, is an initiative brought to you by the International Center for Journalists, ICFJ, and Boom Live. Uh, we're fact checkers. We're based in India, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. Uh, and so stand by towards the end of today's session. We'll, we'll, we'll do a proper detailed announcement. But uh, essentially, ICFJ is offering 18 grants for all kinds of content producers to develop any sort of project. So when we say multimedia, it can be across media, it can be a hybrid of media that break new ground to spread factual information. So those are two things we've got to keep in mind. It has to be innovative. And of course, it has to be involved in spreading facts. And applications for this will be opening on the 16th of April. Winners will be announced in early May, uh, and what, 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 um, what, what, what's the eligibility? So you must have attended at least three Empowering the Truth Global Summit sessions. Um, you've got to upload a letter of support uh, signed by a news media organization. Uh, it could be your own organization. It could be some other organization. You must have some kind of track record in producing digital content, uh, and. But let me just quickly also tell you what we're going to be doing. Um, um, this whole project is going to end before September 30th, 2023. Uh, it has to innovate either in format, technology, or distribution in the process. So there's many ways you can innovate as well. And uh, those who are selected for this will receive up to 4,000 US dollars each, uh, and you'll also get mentors. So please think about applying and we'll talk about uh, this a little more after Rishad's session and after the Q&A with Rishad. And as always, uh, make sure that if you have any questions, type them in into the Q&A box. We'll try and answer as many as possible. So on that note, uh, Rishad, it's over to you. I'm just going to stop sharing. Wonderful. 
Uh, thank you for that. Um, sounds like an exciting program. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. There we go. That's what I have. Can everybody hear and see screens and all of that? Everything works? Yes. All right. We're getting some floating thumbs. Awesome. All right. Uh, I'm going to run through these. Uh, we're talking about a few different things here. Um, you know, keep typing your questions in as you have them or comments. And um, if I see them in between, I'm going to uh, jump right on them. So here we go. Um, you know, we started out with this uh, topic of journalists who want to spread facts and how to approach that from a design point of view. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to sort of amend that a tiny bit. And rather than this whole spread facts, which sounds like a, a broadcast situation, I'm going to change that a little bit uh, uh, live live editing. How about journalists who want to solve user problems to build trust? And let's see how we can do this through design, right? So a little bit about who I am and where I come from. And I promise you that's literally two slides. Uh, we're Splice, we help you build a viable media business regardless of where in the media ecosystem you are in the world. Uh, we work with journalism creators and media startups and we have all the verbs, all of these verbs that we do. We one of them is you know what's missing is incubate. We also accelerate. We research, advise all of this, all of that good stuff. We're excited about what we do, and the reason we do it uh, is because uh, we're huge, huge fanboys of journalists and media startups. We have giant respect for you, and we've somehow managed to turn this into uh, in, into uh, a living. Um, that's 100% of the company on the screen there. One of those two is me. The other guy is my dear old friend and co-founder, Alan Soon. Uh, let's move on. Here's some of the stuff we'll talk about today. Um, who, is, who is design for? Um, what does it even mean? Um, who gets to do design? What is this horrible term product market fit? that the guys in the sales and marketing team talk about. Who are you? And I don't mean who are you, who are you? I mean, who are you online? Um, there's a tiny case study, and then there's a whole bunch of basic design principles that have to do with trust. Um, for those of you who are expecting that I talk about typefaces and fonts and cool colors and rectangles, fitting other rectangles, uh, this is a good time to leave. I'm not going to be able to do any of that, even though I am a product design uh, guy by trade. I do branding, design, and all of that. Um, but moving on, let's talk about bad design. That's always a good part to, you know, place to begin a discussion on design. Dark patterns. I've, I've made up some terms here. Uh, you know, I'm in the word invention business, maybe. Misdesign formation. What about the algorithm? There's dark UX, there's clickbait, you know all of this. There's trolling and, oh my God, and there's also pop-ups, right? Bad design is everywhere. It's all over the place. Um, and the interesting thing is that it helps to have a discussion for bad design before we get into what we should be doing, because then I can nag you for two days and we'll all still be here. But it's anything that gets in the way of solving your users problem of getting in the way of your user, whoever your user is in whatever part of media you work in, they're trying to solve a problem. They have a problem that they're dealing with, not in the media, in their lives. This happened to me recently, you know, misinformation hit me recently. I was here last week. Uh, this is a nature reserve in Nairobi and I was fortunate enough to be asked to go and uh, speak at a conference there. So we're all in the Jeep and with a whole bunch of people. And, you know, we're really excited about seeing these hippos and suddenly somebody yells, oh my God, there's a baby croc. And I was so excited and I come and look out of the Jeep and I'm like, where, where, where? Not that, this. 
And I was like, come on, man. You know, <laughs> I was a little worried there for a second. But it's a plague out there, seriously. I understand what you guys are dealing with. You know, we work with, you know, we respect folks like Venkatesh and what he's doing with Boom. Um, and what I'm trying to say is that if what you guys and the fact checking, the, 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 the very, very serious, very worrying fact checking industry are doing, if that's the vaccine, design is daily hygiene. Design is the boring stuff. It's like brushing your teeth, right? There's, it's boring, you do it every day, it's quick, you get it over with, but it has huge consequences. I looked it up on Google. Apparently, it's not just about tooth decay and gums. It prevents the onset of Alzheimer's and heart disease. Who knew? Brush your teeth, do good design. We'll have more of these naggy little design tips later on in the, in the show. But let's move on to what we're doing here. You know, we've spent so many years designing for an emotional response. You know, click here, read that. You know, you'll never guess what trims your tummy fat. It's all of this, right? What if it's now time to design for trust? Let's look at this whole design thing. This, it's, 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 such a, it's such a ambiguous term. Let's set some guiding principles up. And I'm gonna be really quick around this. What if design is solving a problem for your specific user? Who is a designer? You are. You in the room, if you're a journalist or a fact checker, or you run a media organization, or you're starting something on your own, you're a designer. You currently are designing right now. Why design? What is the point of it? It's relevance with your user, utility for your user, and value for both of you. These things build trust. There's no escape from design. If you're a journalist, you're already in the business of solving, solving a problem for your user. But you're already a designer, right? As if you work anywhere in media, you're designing something. You're designing a spreadsheet, man, but you're designing a system for someone or a solution for someone or an experience. And you have massive, massive power. You're doing all of this and it's formidable. We know the bad guys are using this power. We might as well use it for good. And maybe here are a few ways to do that. But first, I'm gonna play a little game with you. Make believe, okay? Suppose you're a little company that makes shoes. Think about it. And you decide that you're going to go into, um, uh, into Mongolia, uh, just because Duya is on, you know, part of this chat. And you're, you've decided, I make really good basketball shoes. I've decided Mongolia needs to play more basketball. I'm going to make basketball that or shoes. And in fact, I'm going to set up a factory. It's going to be, you know, 20 million bucks. And I'm going to produce not just a few shoes, but I'm going to mass produce shoes. This is basketball all the way. We do it really well. In fact, let's put some marketing money in behind it. Not just a little bit, but a lot of, let's put 10 million marketing budget. But here's the weird thing. It's not working. People aren't buying basketball shoes. So let's take it to the streets and let's talk to that customer. Hey man, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you buying our shoes? We make these amazing basketball shoes. And they said, mm, yeah, well, what shoes do you want? Don't you want basketball shoes? No, I want football shoes. Mm. Wow, <laughs> we have a problem here. And what, what do we call this problem? I call this problem introducing two people, right? Hey, product, meet my friend market. And this is why we need product market fit. Now replace all these shoes and all these customers with what you're producing, all the content you produce. And then ask yourself, are you producing basketball shoes or are you producing the football boots? Moving on. Let's look at other little case studies. All the stuff that we use, most of us use, you know, all over the world. 
Some of them are called semi-evil companies. Um, but all the stuff we use are based on user-centric systems that design trust. So let's look at Netflix. Netflix was in the, you can have a movie anytime you like business because the user wanted it, right? Uber decided you can get a cab in the rain. He's not gonna overcharge you and he'll know the way. Apple said, you can buy just the three songs you want. Amazon said, evil Amazon said, you can get great customer service, great delivery and great prices. And Airbnb said, you can now afford to travel. So what did they do? It wasn't rocket science, right? They gave people what they wanted. And it's, you know, arguably, people trust these guys right now. Uh, are you guys seeing glitches on my screen? Yes, it only turned up in two slides. Right. It's gone so these though. guys gave, yeah, I just moved the window and somehow it's gone. So these guys gave people what they wanted, right? In fact, before that, they found out what it was people wanted, right? They actually ended up asking. So they asked. So it's not tech that's the big disruption that we constantly blame it for. The big threat to our media industry is we fail to not just give people what we want, but we fail to ask. And I think that has a huge amount to do with trust. So what if we asked and then we listened and then we acted on the feedback we got and then we did it again and then we did it again and again and again. Let me give you a case in point. Our friends in Frontier Myanmar, which happens to be in Myanmar, um, had a real crisis uh, a, few, a few years ago. Think before the coup, before COVID, this is like the end of 2018. That was a real problem. They're losing money. They haven't paid 19 employees salaries for five months. They're on the brink of losing their office. They haven't paid their rent. They're on the brink of losing their, uh, their magazine, print magazine, because it costs more to make than, than produce than the money they actually make off of it. It's a hard problem. And I think a lot of people in the room and around um, you know, are familiar with this problem. So they asked us, you know, we got them a grant and we said, okay, let's build memberships. You, need, you guys need to talk to your community. And I said, how do we build this? We said, we have no idea. Let's ask the right people. Let's ask potential members. So we get a bunch of people in a room. And this is the, the Frontier Myanmar conference room in Yangon. Sadly, of course, they all live in exile now, so it doesn't exist any longer. Uh, we got a bunch of people around the table and we said, listen, we're building a membership program. We need your support. Um, what do you guys want? We wanna build what you want. And we also want your money. One important point though, there in the center of the table, um, is a tray of biscuits. My advice to you, A, never run any kind of audience feedback without a, a user feedback without biscuits. These were some of the most addictive biscuits I've eaten in my life. And I'm convinced that they powered all the discussions that we had thereafter. But we asked these guys, and we had identified these people who would take this message of Myanmar and Frontier Myanmar as advocates worldwide. And we decided that these folks would pay for it. And rather than advertising, subsidizing the product, it would be diplomats, journalists, academics, NGOs, and businesses. And we said, here are some assumptions we're making. Here are some use cases. Do you agree with our problem? Is this the problem you wanna solve? You don't have to read this. These are just specific problems that we thought Frontier could solve for these folks. And there was some agreement and we threw a whole bunch of products at them. We said, what about conference calls as part of your membership? They were like, no, please not conference calls. Slack groups, no. What about data visualization and reports? They're like, yeah, that sounds really boring, thanks. What we then offered them was the idea that 
they said, look, do what you do best. You do investigative journalism. We depend on you for our work. You're an important tool in, uh, for us to be able to continue doing the work that we do in the various businesses and uh, institutions that we're in. So we buy into your mission. You don't, into your mission. You don't really have to give us stuff. We want to support you because we want you to exist because we think we think you're important for this transformation in Myanmar. They said they wanted newsletters and events. A little detail about the newsletters. They said, "Can I don't read Burmese? Can you help me translate? Just give me quick headlines." Cool. What about Parliament? When Parliament's in session, we need to know what's going on. Can you give us that in a newsletter? Fantastic. Can you monitor very specific topics around trade, around security, around business, around the junta, around you know, freedom of expression? Can you give me what's going on behind the scenes in the newsroom? And can you give me members updates? They also did events. Uh, Frontiers events are massive. They, they have beautiful events with a whole bunch of experts online, offline. And they, they bring, you know, uh, events are treated as a news product. And the beautiful thing about this, the amazing thing about asking people what they want, is that that membership program continues to pay all the salaries now for months and months in a newsroom that was on the brink of closing down. This was powerful. So how do we do this? How do we continue to do this as people that work in media? How do we think about what our users want, how we build stuff that meets that need, and how do we make money doing this? How do we build that value chain? So what if it's not the five Ws and the one H that we're use, used to because that talks about content? What if it's who needs this information? What do they need it for? Why? In what format do they need it? Is the newsletter or a podcast or is it the same content in a newsletter and a podcast for different audiences? Because that's how they consume it. What can they do with this? How will they act? And how do I know this is true? And how can I continue to check that? Right? At Splice, we're very clear. We think that the future of media has nothing to do with content. Content is just what we do in a conversation with each other. But it's beginning that conversation that's important. And beginning a conversation, a good conversation with anybody at any scale on any medium is centered around the other person. It's centered around what they need and it's centered around what they're interested in, right? What if we were to stop being the content business and start being, what if journalism was a service industry? What if we're in the help people solve problems business? These are all the problems they want to solve, right? These are the decisions that design, journalism design, content design, relationship design, design for trust can actually help them with elections. The big question about, about home and where to live. Education, what do I do for a job? What's my next job? How do I get healthy? Where do I shop? How do I save money? What about the climate? all of that good stuff. So let's just cut to who you are, because I think that's a huge part of design. Who are you really, you guys in the room? I mean, I'm gonna ask you why you trust me. There's 44 of you in the room. And I'm, I'm curious whether you trust me and or Venkatesh or Divya. And I think that maybe there's a beginning of that trust here because we have names, we have faces, we're addressing you. You can look us up on LinkedIn. We have social proof. You know, other, you know, Venkatesh said, you should come to this talk by this guy because he's trustworthy. Here's his face, here's, here's who he is. He's a real person. He mostly knows what he's talking about. There's a lot of that about trust, right? So let's talk about your website. And this is as a designer, who makes a lot of brand and a lot of web stuff and a lot of interaction design. This is a huge problem. I find that so many of your websites, and I mean media websites, journalism websites, they talk about how you're telling untold stories 
and journalism that matters. And you're doing, you know, you, you're doing amazing work, but there it's anonymous. You don't tell me who you are. Very few of you actually put names and pictures there. Uh, if anything, it's like three management people. But this is a huge problem with, this, with, with trust. So here's what a journey looks like, right? Here's how people meet you in the first place. Let's imagine this big dinner party. They walk through the door through either search, email, or social. They encounter a story in some form or other. And if your recommendation engine works well, they go to another one and another one. But then ultimately, they're going to want to know, all right, hey, who are you? So interesting. Where do you work? What do you do? What, what are you all about? They go to your about page. It's this massive converse, conversation opportunity, right? It's like saying, hi, nice, nice to see you. Thanks for even making it here. It's, it's us, us folks in the news business, in the media business, are the only people who put product out without really wondering who's reading it, who's consuming it, who it's for, why we do it, and what the follow-up is. We rarely speak to our users. We rarely know how to. And I'm saying, this is your chance, you know? I mean, a good way to do it is to imagine if your website was an employee, right? Literally. Um, you need three things, right? You've got to set them up with a job description. Here's what I want you to do, website. You've got to have outcomes for success. I want you to achieve this every week, this every month, and this every six months, and at least that every year. And then you pay it a salary. And I mean salary, right? You spend something on your website. And by website, I mean Twitter. I also mean Instagram. I mean whatever you like, you know, uh, podcast. It's your surface to the world. Now let's talk about that job description. What do we want this about page to, to achieve? How are you going to design it in order to build that trust, in order to earn that trust? Here's the problem we solve. And here's who we solve it for. Here's our mission. And really, that just means here's where we are, here's where we want to be, and here's how we'll get there. Show me who you are. Back to my original point, who are you? Who are you people? Show me what other people think of you. Involve me. Now I'm speaking in the voice of your user. I want you to involve me. You've told me all about you now. Great. But how can I, now how do I jump in? What's my into your life, into this mission, into this conversation? Interesting one. How do you make your money? How do you win? How do you lose? Tell me how you lose. Stop telling me you're an award-winning journalist. I'm not impressed by that. Tell me how you lose because it makes, me, makes you more human to me. It's a real person and maybe I can help. I want to share you. If I'm really impressed by now, then I want to share you. I don't just want to share your product, your stories, your journalism. I want to share you. How do I give you money? This is a real thing we've heard from real people, by the way. In a lot of focus groups, we've heard, make it easy to take my money. I'll come to that later. How do I meet other people like me? And how do I get in touch with you? Isn't it amazing how many people leave this out? Hey, if you have a tip or if you have a story, drop a line to our editor here. No, man, I don't have a story. I don't, I don't, I'm not a journalist. I don't have anything. I just have a, I'm just, I just want to say hi. I love what you're doing. So let's run through these. Why do you exist? What problem are you solving for me that nobody else is? This is your user, remember. How are you getting me from this is my problem to B, this is my solution. How you're getting me from A to B is your mission. It can look really messy. How we get there is really messy. Oh, we've got this and we want that. We try and fix, but at least it tells you a path. It's a map. It's a way to get there. Imagine a map without here's where you are and here's where you want to go. Nightmare. What is your mission? What is this change that you're bringing about? How can I get involved? How can we do this thing together? Then back to that whole, who are you thing? 
like what's on your about page apart from these fancy words about journalism, right? If you're nameless and faceless, man, let's talk about trust. That's absence of credibility. There's absence of any kind of authority. It's worrying. You know, it ends up looking like this. And that's not cool. You want to show people who you are. All of your audiences, including people you work with, your clients, your advertisers, your funders and grant makers, who are you? It puts a name to your mission. It puts a face. It makes you responsible. It starts a, and it makes you human. So it's this, right? It's you stand out. Here you are. That's me. That's what I look like. Even better, here's what I sound like on email. Now tell me who else trusts you? Who else does this thing, right? Put an endorsement of your work. I love working with these people. Here's my name. This person really likes us. Maybe you will too, right? It's still so much like a really good conversation in a room full of people, right? What makes you stand up? What makes you interesting? Then you wanna tell your user, hey, enough about us. A little more about you. What can I do here? What about a call to action? Not, hey, read my story, buy my news, read my story, buy that, man, thanks. What about all of this stuff? I don't mean all together, please. I mean, literally one of these things. What can I do here? If I get a lot of journalists sometimes saying, no, but this looks like selling, that's not my job. No, it's not selling, dude. This is not selling. This is you, this, a lot of these have nothing to do with money. This is your about page. This has nothing to do with your news. This is saying, hey, let's, we really want you to come and comment. We really want you to do this. We, if you want to turn up at the office, and in turn, we want you to come, we want you to tell us what you think. We want you to, any amount of these things, right? At Splice, we call this menu problem. If you don't put it on a menu, I don't know what to order. Then the other thing, I wanna know how you make your money. This is a big deal. There's too much opacity right? I don't know. Maybe I have an affiliate deal. Do I click on this link? Do you not? I'm not going to tell you. It's all a little bit shady. How do you make your money? Tell me. Why should you tell me? Because you want, I, you want me to trust you. This could be a simple statement. It could be, hey, we, we do some ads. We have a sub stack where we take money for our newsletter. And ICFJ gives us grants. How about that? Simple. Then tell me how you win and then tell me how you lose. Because it makes you human. It makes me want to connect. It makes me maybe want to help you. And it also makes me want to trust you. So I don't know how many of you know Tanmoy Goswami. He's a buddy of ours at Splice. I love that this guy runs mental health journalism uh, with a thing called sanity. And he does it all by himself, um, mostly. And every year, he'll give you like his little annual report. And he'll tell you what his financial numbers are. You can look at his spreadsheet. Here's the grants he got. Here's some you know, offers he got. Here's what really worked. And here's where he really screwed up. It's amazing. Then I want to tell other people about you. How do I share you? Again, we're not talking about your news product here. We're talking about you, your organization, yourselves and your mission. How do I say, look at these amazing people. Look at what they stand for. Look at their principles. Check them out. Check their code of ethics. They're amazing. I'm, I follow them. I want you to follow them. Now we're taking it further. What about a little more commitment? It was funny, this whole take my money thing. So we did an audience research study. We helped Puma Podcast, which is a podcast company in the Philippines. We helped them speak to their listeners. And we did all this stuff. You know, this was the landing page that you could sign up on. And a common thread in the focus groups we ran over and over and over again was, 
how do I give you what, what do you want to give me money for? Like Carl, the, the CEO, is like, what, what money for? I just want to support you. I love what we do here. You give me a safe space. Sometimes just shut up and take my money can be really simple. Clarify your mission, say that you want support and say, here's what we're gonna use the money for. It's a great way for people to join you on a journey. It's shared purpose. And it also makes what you're doing very clear to funders and grantors, right? Here we are in this grant economy but it's also an attention economy. And, and let's face it, it's a trust economy, right? And then how do I meet other people like myself? Addressing one person's problem is fantastic. Showing that person that they're not alone with that problem, I don't know how to vote. How do I decide rent or buy? Uh, where do I go to school? How do I find a job? How do I figure out this thing? You're not alone. Here's other people. Carl, back to Puma podcast in the Philippines. We helped him with this. And they finally put out on, their, on a podcast or their, or their website or Insta or something. And he said, we had our first in-person audience engagement activity, which is fancy language for we hung out with our listeners. And these guys got in a, in a room one day played instruments and jammed and laughed themselves silly and then ordered pizza for dinner. And they all hung out. I mean, this is the first time they had ever done this. What did their listeners tell them? We want to hang out with you. We don't care whether you do podcasts or make ball bearings. Literally, okay? We don't care. He was, he was worried. What do, you, what do you listen to us for? We want to hang out with you. It's a politically safe space in very polarized Philippines, and we want to hang out with each other. Cool. And then finally, we want to get in touch with you. How difficult is this? Give me an email address on your About Us page, on your mission page. What do you think about what we're doing? What should we do more of? What should we do less of? What, is the, what do you wish we, we, we addressed? We're not talking fancy service. We're talking email. Please don't send newsletters from, you have just received an email from, you know, be a real person, have a name. Never make your email address, do not reply at fancycompany.com. And then what if I want to break up with you? You know how you've been hiding that little unsubscribe button in light gray in four point at the bottom of your newsletter? Stop doing that. Designing for trust means you're making it nice and huge and bold because A, you want people to trust you and B, you don't want people hanging around if they're not gonna open your newsletter. What's the point, right? More ways to get to know a community and then let people give you feedback, constant. Every single surface out there that you put out and by which I mean every podcast, every newsletter, every single, website page in your footer. Do you have a feature request? Is there something you wish we could do? Is there a broken link on the website? Hit this, tell us about it, and then respond to that. At Splice, we respond to every single email that are, when we get a subscription for one of our newsletters. Every single email. The users are showing you which way they want to go. They're showing you every single day, all the time. All we have to do is look. How are we doing for time, Venkatesh? Um, we're doing well. We're okay? So, yes, go ahead. Okay, how's everybody doing? I have now a whole bunch of specific design tips that I'm gonna zip through. Uh, a lot of this is stuff that we've built over the years. Uh, we're really excited about this. It all comes from solid experience. So here we go. I started out writing this, this deck, talking about what good design meant and what good design meant for trust. And then I, I was like, you know, if you're not trustworthy, 
you're probably not good design at all. You're really not. So walk, walk the talk. All good design is designed for trust. And it's for trust with specific users, with your collaborators. And I mean, so all your, I'm talking about your community and then all your separate audiences within that community. Even if that audience is one person who sits in a policy uh, role in Washington or Ulaanbaatar or Mumbai, this is an audience. Make sure you design for that trust, right? We're back to the hygiene issue. Remember this guy? It's good design is really boring. It's not dramatic. It's really boring. You do it every day with, you know, you're half asleep, but you do it. Because, you know, if you don't, you're going to smell, you're probably going to get tooth decay, and you might even get Alzheimer's and heart disease, right? Small things make big pivotal changes. Good design's in the background. It's not in your face. It's not a big pop-up blocker, fancy, hey, you're in the middle of reading this article, read my newsletter, right? Good design is really, really, it, it's quick. Get rid of all those grip, grip and grin photos on your page with you know, politicians shaking hands with you know, guys in suits. Get rid of the picture, nobody will miss it and your page will lose, load five times faster. It's all, it should also load on your mobile and whatever else watch and device you have. And it should also have a, a lock in, 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 the, in the address bar without fail, regardless of whether you're taking money or not. These are small, boring things. Brush your teeth, do good hygiene. Good design, it's don't tell me how cool you are because you have, you know, because you're DEI. Good design does this in the background. It is inclusive, it is diverse. It's never gonna have a manual with four dudes on a stage telling you how cool they are. It's never gonna have four dudes in a story as sources without a single woman in there. And that's just one part of inclusion. That's good design. That's really good design. See what I mean about you being a designer, even as a journalist? This is what I mean. This is spectacular design. Good design has nothing to, this is why I took out the word spread. It has nothing to do with the spreading fact. It has very specifically to do with, with, with niche. We're talking to that one person, right? It talks to one person at a time. It's like newsletters. Rather than say, hey, everybody out there. Hey, you guys. It's nobody sitting around a computer or a phone reading your newsletter together. It's one person. Even on radio, they used to say it's narrow cast. I used to work in radio ages ago. A little thing called uh, Radio Midday in Bombay. You're never talking to a bunch of people. TV was different, TV was broadcast. Radio was narrowcast. You spoke to one person at a time because they're usually in their car driving home in some crazy traffic, right? So there's that. Nobody identifies, none of us identify as, you know, hey, who are you? I'm a young person, 18 to 35, and I live in a city. Have you ever introduced yourself like that? You're talking to one person. Remember that. So it's specific. It's never generic, right? Good design champions your user. Good design is not about talking about yourself. Even as a news company, especially as a news company, you have a product, never content. Content hasn't been king for the longest time. Get rid of that. Content is just how you talk to someone and you talk to them around what they're interested in. If you stood there and talked to me, a nonstop monologue about what you liked without asking me a single question about me, I'm probably gonna walk away from the conversation. I'm never gonna call you back. Don't tell me about your award-winning journalists. Tell me how you're making me, your user, a champion. Good design is looking you in the eye, it's listening to you right there with your permission. 
It's efficient. Your you, good design is not making basketball shoes for a bunch of people who wanted to play football in the first place, but you never asked us. And that, you're wondering why we don't buy your shoes. You're wondering why we don't read your stories and listen to your podcasts. Here's why. It's don't waste. What if you're producing too much content? Just wondering, right? Good design is obsessive. It's not one time, one off. It's you're obsessed with solving problems in your community because that's what makes you really, really relevant. Remember that whole thing about you ask and then you listen to what, the answer and then you sit there and you make changes based on the feedback and then you show them, what do you think of this? The Frontier Myanmar team I showed you about, told you about, those guys, after we knew what these five newsletters were and these events, it took three months of nonstop getting back to these people till they were blue in the face. Hey, you said you wanted a media monitor newsletter of all the headlines in Burmese newspapers. Here they are. Did we go into too much detail? Is it too long? Is it too short? Is it too frequent? Tell us the answer to these three questions. Yes, yes, no. Next week, here's another one based on your feedback. What do you think now? They're like, oh my God. Hey, you asked, man. It, we didn't design these products. The Frontier team didn't design these products. The people who were potential members designed their own membership package. And it's still going. And it's, it's picking up pace. It's amazing. It's iterative. It responds to feedback. That's good design. And that's the rest of your career as a journalist. If we are to survive, at least for the next five years, in this business we're in. Good design is a checklist. Have I done that? Did I do the SEO? Did I tag the images? Have I done, can, can people see the buttons? Done, done, yep, mm, okay, now hit publish. Good design is about football shoes for people who need football shoes. By all means make basketball shoes, but that's another audience that you've asked in advance. Good design is a system. It's about utility for the user. It's relevance in the user's life and it's building value, real value for your user. And a little detail, maybe do a spell check. Always helps. Solid business strategy. Where are we? Where do we want to get to? And how do we get there? Almost every story. Why am I telling you the story? I'm not talking about solutions journalism, by the way, or constructive journalism. We're not interested in those labels. We're saying seven out of 10 people that we spoke to last week that they were really concerned about this specific thing. So here's that specific thing you asked for, and here's what we want you to do with it, right? Good design doesn't build trust. We're not in charge of building trust. We, we earn it. We earn it really slowly. And we do it in ways that don't scale at all. Good design will never tell me what you do. It will tell me what you do for me, especially on your About Us page. It's not about how good it looks. It's about how well it works. It's transparent and it's bullshit free. It's respectful, it has no hubris, it's really humble. Tell me who you really are. Give me your name, your email address and your face. And then ask me who I am. I'll tell you as your user. It's good service. What if you were a service industry? And then finally, we're altruistic guys, Alan and I, that's Splice, and it works for us. Good design. It's just being good, even when nobody's looking. And that's the end. If anybody has questions, go for it. If you guys yes. want to do a bunch of stuff with Splice, go for it. Yeah, we'll keep, we can keep that page on for a while for people to, you know, get their cameras out and do the QR code thing if they're so disposed. Oh, but no. this has been... 
immensely uh, helpful and amazing. Rishad, thank you so much. Um, and and uh, for those of you, if you have questions, please drop your questions into Q&A. Um, you can ask any kind of question. Uh, there's no such thing as a wrong question. So please go ahead. Um, one question people might want to ask, but they may not want to ask, uh, they, they may have not yet asked is about, you know, fonts and font sizes and colors and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. If you have those kinds of questions as well, please go ahead and ask. Yeah, uh, go for it. Yeah. Uh, Always uh, happy to. You know, you know, one question I want to ask uh, Rishad is, um, you know, the, the whole design thing, um, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, uh, the word design became a, kind of a buzzy word, I think a few years ago, about what, five to 10 years ago with Stanford D school really, uh, you know, taking, becoming really famous and um, mm -hmm. IDO and companies like that. Um, and for most people, design is probably more like aesthetics, you know, what looks good and what doesn't look good. How do you resolve the dilemma for yourself? Like, for example, when I look at um, the Splice website, um, I'm struck by how you follow everything that you've advocated for just now. You tell me exactly what I'm going to get. But at the same time, it also looks really nice. You know what I mean? And it looks, renders really beautifully on a mobile phone screen. So can you tell us a little bit about that as people think about getting asking you questions? Sure. I, I you know, I, I grew up uh, as a designer who, you know, when you're a young designer, you start, you, you want to impress people. You want to do these amazing visuals and graphics, and you know you want to copy trends and all of that. Um, and I'm, I think I'm old enough to have copied a lot of trends along the way. I'm sure, you know, um, sound design, uh, web design, print design. Um, but I never studied design. Uh, I couldn't afford to. I studied political science and history. And it was it was uh, fantastic. I'm pretty sure it's taught me more about design than uh, design school would have. But maybe I just tell myself that to feel good about my choices or, or my options. But I think I learned very quickly that it it had to have utility. A great page on your website is like a great story, you know. You can work on it, you can build it up, it can be this beautiful thing. But if nobody can use it or nobody sees it, or it doesn't load fast enough, or it doesn't, or it doesn't, I can't find it fast enough on Google, then it's lost. It's a ship in the night. It you're never gonna see it. People don't hang around for their pages to load. People leave after what is it, point eight, an eighth of a second they start dropping off because that's way too long in your, and, and you know, as a news organization, your, your competition isn't the other news organization, remember. It's the WhatsApp message that just came in. It's the presentation by this guy that you've just got to go to. It's the person that, you know, the game that you want to play. It's Duolingo telling you, keep your streak going. It's stuff you have to do on your phone. So I started designing for that. And I just started designing for, you know, how do I cut all this bullshit down, optimize my images? What if I tag my images so that makes them more useful? Google started doing a great thing. They started with this carrot and stick situation. If you make your page responsive for mobile as well, then we'll promote you in search rankings. But if you don't, you're not, you're, you're not gonna show up in search ranking. So as a designer, you know, we started learning from that. You started learning when Google said, hey, if you mess with our users, we're gonna mess with your business. So get all your stuff right. That's why it's all this boring stuff. Make your H1 the headline. 
if you don't have to put a pic, that our newsletters, my design newsletter is every week and I talk about product design. I don't have a single image in there because it's not important. I'm talking to people who are interested in product design. It's a very B2B situation. I write it every week based on what I'm reading and what's working and that, you know, product design stuff out there. So it has nothing to do with fancy fonts. The, the best font for design is the one that loads the quickest. The best image for good design is the one that your text, your headline cannot tell you. If you're going to put a, a headline of a woodpecker on a tree and then your, your headline says, here's a woodpecker on a tree, ah, it's not doing very much for me. That kind of thing. So I, I guess that's where we come from. So I'm just going to answer some of these questions. Is there an audience in India that's willing to pay for good design or truth? One that is bipartisan on bias. I don't know. That's uh, Shiva Roy Chaudhary. Uh, that is the question for the ages. Is there an audience? You know who know that? It's those audiences. So if you went, for example, this is maybe a dumb idea, but if you went to where these audiences already hang out, you know how we talk in the news industry, in the media industry, but you've got to build a community. Don't build a community. They're right there. They're already there. You don't have to build it. You don't build an audience. They're right there. So what if you went to a subreddit that was about, you know, uh, responsible design? I'm sure there's a subreddit somewhere in there that talks to design and that talks to design around uh, facts or design, design around trust. I'd love for you to maybe see questions in there and say, hey, um, you know, I'm planning to do a Google Meet lecture series on great design. And I'm gonna have one designer show up every week. Uh, is that something you'd pay $20 a month for? Or $100 a year? Because this is what I need to make this happen. That's how you test this question. You test with the audience and say, are you willing to pay for this? And if here's the interesting thing. If people say, no, I will not pay you $10 a month for that, don't ask them, what will you pay? Ask them, what do I need you to do? What do I need to do in order for you to pay that? Uh, somebody's anonymous attendee, Hi, anonymous attendee, uh, says, I read this article you've written on the Splice blog about passive audio. Do you feel audio, audio as an enhancer for user experience is something we look at more? Or is it something that we'll consider later on as diminishing the user experience? I think, anonymous attendee, I think what you're, I think what you're asking me here is to comment on a trend or whether something's going to be a trend or not. I, I'm not a huge, I don't think it's a trend. I have no idea. I have also no interest in trends. I think we tend to, I'm, I, I'm not good with the prediction business. Uh, you know, I think that there are users that want to listen to books and there are users who want to read books. There are users who will do both depending on the weight of the book, on the price of the book, the availability of the book, or the language the book is in. Do you see where I'm going with this? Audio is not an enhancer. It's not an enhanced user experience. It's just a different product for a different audience, for a different user. So that's what I have for that. I like the question. Hey. <laughs> I have a question that I'm going to ask on uh, people's behalf, and it's also an area that interests me. So this is the whole font font size question, uh, which is, um, so even if we looked at the slide that you've shared, uh, some things that I can see going on are, it's a white screen, uh, the font is pink, it's large. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's gone. Oh, do you want Your me to put... Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. Any of your oh. slides. Any of your I, slides. I was just referring to the slide 
sure, that you sure. had on. Sure. Um, so it's a question that I'm kind of base, basing on the slides that you have uh, and to uh -huh. use that as a sort of, uh, it could be any slide. So what I see is it's just a single color. Uh, and uh, I think most of your slides have really easily readable font sizes. So that already gives me the clue that if I want to design something um, and taking all of the stuff that you've taught us in consideration when we get to the tactics part of it, the 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 signal that I'm getting is uh, go with really big font sizes, uh, and it's okay to have just one single color. So, so <laughs> I just want hey, to toss that no, in there. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, that no, that's pretty interesting, and and this is this is exciting for me uh, because we're, I mean, each of these slides that I see has a role to play. And what, what I like to do with design is to make sure that it has one single call to action. So if you have a screen on any of your pages, anybody in this room, if you have a screen, give me one call to action. What do you want me to do with it? Here's a, here's a video. What should I do with this video? Should I sign up? Should I buy? Should I forward? Should I? What? Tell me that one call to action. Give me one button. This slide is a question slide. It cannot be anything else. This slide wants you to hit that link. By the way, that link does not take you to our website. Nobody wants a huge website on your phone. This is our, this is our link in bio. It doesn't give you a header. It doesn't tell, it gives you about six things to do. That's it. Six things to do with Splice. And it's especially for things like this. I don't want you to see our whole footer, big nonsense bullshit. You know, this is our skip intro button that Netflix has. How often do you guys use skip intro? Man, for me, that might be the most important call to action in our lives in the last decade. I mean, I'm being, I'm being facetious, but this is skip intro. I don't want you to do everything. I don't want you to read a whole website. What's the point? I want you to ask questions. I want to nag you about something. So I'm going to keep doing this. I want to do specific things around, you know. So what we also, what, what we also believe in is, is one single idea per screen. I think that is important. There's a single idea I want you to uh, want want you to discover for yourself or think about. So I'll do that, rather than you know give you a whole list of bullet points. Right? I could have put all these design tips and fill the screen with it, but then it's like a map with no no starting point, no end point, no journey in between. What do you do with that? So I think a lot of, so to translate, what does a big font do? A big font really tells you, for any, any kind of information, you, and it's a newspaper page, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a web page, whatever it is, it tells you this, it's all about information hierarchy. By doing that, I'm giving my user a map. And I'm telling them, I want you to start here. You know, I want you to begin here and I want you to maybe read this second. But you've, you've been reading this for the last few slides, so it's become a blind spot. But you kind of understand that this is a, this is a subset of this. Even though this is bigger, it's still a subset of this, right? So there's, that's really it, I mean, it's big because it needs to be, it needs to, you need to see it first. That's all really. Yeah, I appreciated it because um, very often people log into uh, these kind of Zoom calls on their mobile devices. It becomes even more difficult to read anything, you know, sure. on a mobile device. So, absolutely. I mean, yeah. Could so, I take Bilal's uh, question? Yes, absolutely. Please do. Oh, uh, one uh, Bilal, you're you're asking. Thanks, thanks so much about, uh, for your question. By the way, 
design significance and factual storytelling. Um, are, are fonts, color, and standalone lines the only game changers to hook audience, or is there something more to it? A, never hook your audience. Um, hook sounds really painful. Um, what I, I, but, but again, I, I understand what you're saying. I think, so, I don't think these are, I'm going to push myself as a career designer who's designed for over 25 years. I don't think fonts, color, and standard on lines have anything to do with that. These things are irrelevant. What's really relevant? So we pay a lot of attention to, Alan and I are really particular about headlines, for example. Headlines are vital. How do I understand from your shop window whether to go into your shop or not? How do I understand from your headline, which is your shop window, whether to go into your story or not? I understand it if you make it clear to me. I, what I cannot stand are the, what I call the Jared Diamond headlines. Guns, germs, and steel. Okay, buddy. Rock and roll and presentations and trees, you know, elections and how they, I, tell me what you want me to know. Tell, give me a headline that says, this is what you will get from this. There's a reason, there's a reason that some of, you know, we're all in this attention economy. We don't have time for all of this, right? So really the game changer, that you're talking about is design. I'm not gonna take it away from you. If it's your headline, make it bigger than your body text. I mean, simple, right? If it's a headline next to a picture, let them talk to each other. Who, what, who are these people in there? If it's a picture that, does, that doesn't add to the story, take it out. If it's that grip and grin, two idiots shaking hands over a deal with microphones in front of them and shiny suits, if it's really relevant, leave it in. But if it isn't, take it out. So I'm saying, give me a headline that says, this is why this, so the summit for you know, sustainability or empowering the truth is important. So there's a lot more to it. Does color play a big role? Ask, asks Vishwajit. Color plays a role if you assign it a job, what is the job of your color? What have you hired that color to do? Is it there to look pretty? Is it there because people don't know what orange looks like? Or is it there because it has a specific role? If, if you give me, if I highlight these, this text in this color, it means I want you to look at it. And I want you to say, there's something going on here. There's a huge difference in these slides, right? Like what if I did, what if I did this? Let's, let's do a little demo right here. Like what if I did that? And I said, hey, the future of design, of uh, future of media is user-centered. Let's, let's, let's throw it up full screen. It's user-centered. And it's demand driven and it's interest based. But what if I then do this? I don't know. Does color play a role? Maybe it does. Maybe there's a reason we highlight stuff, you know, or underline stuff or change the color. That said, please never send me an email where you say, hey, my comments are below in red. Oh my God, those emails are terrible to read. But see, color plays a role, right? Uh, Ruth Bay, um, sorry, I hope, I hope I've answered the question. Um, give it a job, give your color a job, give everything a job. Never put a design element there that you cannot explain strategically. This is why, by the way, designers don't get taken seriously. They don't have a seat at the table because no, I just like red. What's it there for? Is red because it's Chinese? Is it red because it's dangerous? Is it red because I need to pay attention? Is it red because red flag? No, I just felt like red. 
Sorry, man. Bye bye. Um, Bruce Bay. Is security against data theft, cyber attacks, and the like important when we talk about design? Yes. My goodness, what a beautiful question. Um, I want to know what you do for a living, Bruce Bay. This is awesome. If so, what can we do to strengthen this component in our, in our design? I'm going to give you first the boring answer. The boring answer is do good design in the background. Get all your systems just absolutely beautiful. Like make sure you've tagged the images. Make sure that when your image doesn't load, for example, on your website, on your web page, in a, in a low data environment, that when that image placeholder comes with that JPEG broken box, that you've tagged the image with alt text. So it tells me what the image was there for in the first place. Or if I'm having a, using a screen reader, and I'm, I'm blind or I can't see very well, that, you, that I know what the image is because it doesn't just say image one, two, three, dot, final, final, dot JPEG. That makes no sense to me. This is an image of a man standing against the background of a, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange where the thing is low and he's freaking out. Now I know what the image is, right? So yes, security, is important. Look at what a little image does in, in, in a, on a web page, right? A little image that we all see every day, right? Here we are. There's that little lock icon that tells me that I can ostensibly, I, I can trust this page, right? I mean, how interesting is that, right? We've, we've accepted that this is something that we can trust somehow. You know, people are more inclined to make a purchase if there's a lock icon on your buy button than if there isn't. It's, it's daft. It's weird how powerful we are as, as designers. It's weird and it's worrying because, hey, it's an <laughs> image, you know. But what I'm saying is that, oh, what happened to that one? Um, oh, wait, I think I that, no, it's good. I, I found it. So what can we do to strengthen this component? I think it's in the language. By the way, so language and voice and tone are massively uh, understated um, uh, aspects of design, right? It's why I write and I edit and I design and I code and I do all of it, right? Because you've got to. And when you put under your subscribe button, you tell me, hey, we don't do scam. We really hate it and we will never sell your data. Make sure you have the systems there that actually do that. When you have an event, for example, um, you know, how can I, yeah, let me, when you have an event, it would be so amazing if, if, if you made your security policy clear, right? What if you could do that? What if you could do, um, what if you could make sure that you had a security policy in place um, that, that could deal with what you do in the case of a complaint, right? So um, what, if we, what if we had, you know, all of that in place and you made that, you made it obvious, right? What if you had a code of conduct? We recently had... You know, I'm, I'm just showing off my Splice website, uh, so excuse the salesiness. But I'm just saying that the reason we built this code of conduct is because we we heard about firsthand about somebody who was harassed, uh, sexually harassed uh, at a at a at a conference in Singapore, which is bizarre. So this woman who is a friend of us came to us and told us about this horrifying incident. They were like. Uh, and it took ages for it to get 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 addressed. So we made sure that we then wrote a code of conduct, just because we said, "Why don't we have this?" So I wrote to Feli Karike of the News Product Alliance, and I said, "You guys have this amazing thing. Can I steal some of it?" And so uh, she was wonderful, and she allowed us to do this. And then we got Kirsten Hahn to actually. Uh, to actually talk to us about it, 
and then write this. And we said, here's what we're going to do. So this is, I don't know, I, this is not necessarily cyber attack or data theft, but it has a great deal to do with, you know, in real life harassment and in real life trolling. And we're like, this is what we're going to do. Here's what, here's a call to action. This is, if anything happens to anybody of any gender, any time in the SPICE community, here's how we, what we want you to know, here's the action we'll take, and here's what you can do about it. Make it clear, be overt about it, write the rules. I think there's another question. Is there another sure. question? Yep. Okay, so I think we'll take one or two last questions before we wrap up. We're going to wrap up quickly because we want to be yeah. uh, respectful of everyone's time. And, and there's also an announcement. Uh, I want to do the announcement about the grant that we're giving out through ICFJ. So we'll keep mm -hmm. a little bit of time for that. Uh, so this is a question from uh, Nagangom Thomas Singh. Yep. Mm -hmm. Is there any fixed font size or color while putting a design? If so, then what will be recommended size or color? So it's, uh, it's you know, uh, can I just add in a comment? Because, you know, the whole point uh, of Rishad's uh, approach is your problem and your user's problem is going to inform everything, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm assuming that this is not a question you will find easy to answer, but how do how do we do justice to Nagangom's question? Is is what I'm thinking. Sure, um, I think. I mean, I love this. This is this is this is a thing that I I live with every day. By the way, I'm just dropping my uh, newsletter. Um, if you guys want to sign up for more of this design nagging and a lot of responses to all of the questions you're you're asking, please sign up. I'd love you to sign up. Um, I'm interested in media products, media design, and questions like this. So if anything's not covered in the newsletter, you hit reply and I'll answer. Um, we don't need the, we really don't need to share these anymore. So uh, a fixed font color um, when you're building a design. What's the recommended size or color? You know, one of the best things to think about, I'm when you say, you're building a design, Nangom. I'm I'm assuming that you're talking about digital, but it doesn't really matter. So fixed font sizes or colors, no fixed color. No, there is no such thing as a fixed color. Use what you like, as long as you're not going crazy. Use colors. Okay, actually, you know what? Let's 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 bring it back to sharing screen very quickly. Uh, okay. You know, what if you use sizes? Let's look at this, for example. This is, this, is, uh, this is our homepage. We use pink and we use this specific uh, uh, hex code of pink, which is FF2DA1, um, because that's our brand color. That's how you know it's splice. Um, one of the biggest questions we ask when we travel on you know, talks and conferences, hey, why are you guys pink? And we almost always say, in order for you to ask us that question, <laughs> we're pink because we want to provoke you. We're pink because we want to start a conversation. Yeah, usually people are blue or green or red or, you know, yeah, we're pink. Hey, that, that's really it. It's a provocative color. People use pink when they talk about gay people. People use pink when they talk about uh, breast cancer or pink is supposed to be, you know, for little girls. Here we are, two grumpy old men running a media company. Um, so, hey, you know, that's why we use pink. Uh, design, the, the rules of good design, uh, Nangom Thomas Singh, can be really boring. Uh, the reason this says, see, remember, it's not how, what font you use, really. Who cares, right? To a point, really, it doesn't make a difference. Just don't use 28 fonts in a web page because it's that's just crazy. Use two at the most when you're building your website. Use one for the big headlines. Use one for the copy, 
for the body text. And what a lot of people do is use a third for information boxes, whatever you like. And then what else? How do we do information hierarchy? Yes, there are fixed font sizes. You can do whatever size you like, as long as they're fixed differences from each other. So there's a reason that I've written, let's build you a viable media business, because this is what we do for you. Remember design, rule number, whatever it was. Don't tell me what you do. Tell me what you do for me. So that's fixed. This is the biggest font on the page, the biggest font on the entire page. Why? In fact, HTML code calls it H1. What does H1 mean? Headline one. That's how Google knows how to read your page. Where's the H1? If you give me multiple big fonts, I don't know which your, where your hierarchy is. Which is the big, which is the small? Why is this smaller than that? Because I want you to read this first, then this gives you a little context, and then this gives you details. And then this gives you a call to action. What action do I want you to take after having absorbed all this information? Email us. That's it, one call to action. That's my recommended size. Biggest, then smaller, H2, H3, and then H4, and then P1. P1 is your paragraph stuff, all of this. This is P1. These are the details. That's it. Great. So we'll leave, we'll, we'll leave it at that. We've got a little bit of, um, um, we've got a little bit of thinking about fonts as well uh, towards the end. And, uh, but but I, I would like to just circle back before we thank Rishad and say, or let's thank Rishad first. Thank you, Rishad. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> I feel uh, thanks, thanked. Um, thank you so much. Thanks for having us, uh, having me. Very kind of you. Yes, it's been it's been fantastic, and uh, uh, you know the big the big takeaway for me again is that uh, is 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 that uh, screen you shared right at the very beginning about how you know all of design flows from figuring out what a user who your user is, what their problem is, how you're going to solve that problem, and and the design just flows from there, and then it becomes really apparent what you've got to do. But if you start the other way around, then you're going to start obsessing about font sizes and how many fonts and how many colors. I think that's, that's my big learning. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, mm. that, you know, and I'm, I, I'm continuing to learn. I've been doing this for a lot of years and I learn new stuff every day. So, hey, very exciting. Fantastic. Do good design, so thank, you, thank you so much, Rishad. Uh, Stick around, uh, everyone else, for the uh, bit about the grant. But, Rishad, it's been 85, 90 minutes almost. Yeah. So, thank you so much. Have a great day. Um, Thanks for having me, folks. And yes. And please do subscribe to his uh, newsletter. So, it's there. The details are there on the chat box. Cheers, folks. So, Bye. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. So yes, this is what we've had. And uh, just want to do a quick announcement about the Empowering the Truth Multimedia Project Grants that's going to happen uh, in the next few weeks. And so these are the details. The International Center for Journalists is offering 18 grants uh, for content producers. Uh, looking at what I've learned from uh, Rishad in this particular um, in, in this session, I would have changed I would have probably highlighted, you know, the most important part of this screen into a different color. So what is the most important part? 18 grants are being offered. That's one that would have been a different color uh, to develop multimedia projects. So it's not any one kind of project it can be multimedia. It's a mix of media. Uh, that would be another part I would highlight. Uh, applications are open until April 16th. That is already on a bold, it's already been bolded. We can't make out very easily, but it's open until 16th of April, 2023. The winners will be announced in early May. So you have plenty of time. 
So think about what you've learned in the last six sessions uh, and please do apply. I mean, the chances of you getting this grant, it's, it's actually not that bad uh, because there are plenty of problems that we've got to solve uh, and there aren't enough people trying to offer that you know, service to solve these problems. So the goal is to test innovative ways to distribute the facts. So in order to be eligible, you should have attended at least three Empowering the Truth Global Summit sessions. It's not necessary that you should have uh, attended the ones we at Boom we've done. Uh, you could have attended ones that, uh, you know, was in, were in Latin America or uh, I think in Africa also there was, there, there, there was a set of uh, seminars. You've got to upload a letter of support signed by any news media organization. So it can be your own news media organization or for freelancers, it can be for anyone else, right? Uh, you've got to have a track record uh, producing digital content and digital content is essentially any content. So I think that will be easy for every one of us. And you've got to have knowledge and experience. It's a plus. It's not a requirement. It's just a plus. And finally, uh, winning projects, um, they should be in from one of, uh, they should impact a country uh, in one of the regions. You'll find it in the ICFJ website. You must innovate and format technology or distribution uh, to amplify rel uh, reliable news. Com and the whole project ends in four months and you will get something like 4,000 uh, USD. And uh, you can find the application form right there. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to use my phone and see what pops up if I use this QR code. So it takes you to a submittable icfj.submittable um, form. And the form is right there. All the information is there. You just have to create an account on submittable and make the application. Also, uh, there are just a few questions. No, they're not questions. It's just thank you. And uh, people are saying thank you. You can get Fiaz asks, how can you get a recording of previous sessions? All the sessions are available. Uh, all you have to do is go to the ICFJ channel on YouTube. Uh, they're already there. Uh, I think uh, Rishad's will be there in a few days, but the rest of them, they're already there. So you can get a recording right there and then it's always going to be there. Uh, so you can access it. And that's basically it. Uh, thank you so much. And it's been, you know, for those of you who have been with us right from the very beginning, this is the sixth such uh, session we are doing and we are boom live we are boom live dot in we're fact checkers based in india but we also operate in bangladesh and myanmar and we are really interested in all aspects of journalism and communication so make sure that you keep in touch with us as well thank you so much i think we can stop recording now <laughs>